Appamada's programmes and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support really does make a huge difference. You'll find a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Thank you so much. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I count uh, 23 people on the screen, which is fantastic. Um, the uh, We're gonna have some, uh, two people are gonna make uh, some presentations in align with our uh, consideration of this precept today. I see Robin has joined us and I know Robin has offered to help, but I thought Robin that it was gonna be next our next meeting. So you're not planning on. Okay, good. Because I, I if so, I had lost track. Uh, Rosemary Gates and Denise Alvarez are going to be uh, sharing some some information later on uh, that has to do with kind of a psychological and 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 psychophysical understanding of anger and extending further what Diane Rizzetto shares. So. Um, Let's sit for a few minutes together. I'm gonna to ring a bell and uh, let's sit for just uh, five or five minutes or so. And um, please be comfortable how you're sitting. <coughs> uh, I apologize for my cough. It's, uh, it's made worse by having to talk and, and uh, speak into a microphone, so I apologize for that. But um, please sit up straight. Let your, imagine that you have a thread coming from the top of your head that's lightly holding your head so that it can rest gently on the column of your spine. Your spine is not tilting forward or back. It's not tilting to the side in either direction. Your shoulders are not hunched up. They are leaning back and relaxed. Uh, your neck is relaxed and your jaw muscles are relaxed. And uh, I wanna suggest a, a, just a brief meditation to go with this, which is to feel what that relaxation feels like. And to know that that is part of your natural state, to have the capacity to enjoy the life that you are living in this very moment. And you let that feeling of relaxation and joy spread throughout your body as you sit. Um, all right, well, I have a, I wanna say thank you so much to Nancy for being uh, our online host today and making it possible for us to connect. And uh, what a wonderful service it is that, that all our online monitors do for, for, our, for our Sangha, helping us connect across great distances and, and uh, share what we can to, to help each other grow in our, in our path. Um, so, uh, I want to say, of course, all of us have read Diane Rosetto's chapter on what is traditionally the ninth precept, uh, not indulging in anger, which she casts as, I take up the way of letting go of anger. Um, to me, those sound very similar, but she, she makes some subtle points about them. She suggests that we use our meditative practice and and other practices to learn how anger feels in our bodies in a controlled way that, 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 that is in a way that can at least start out as low stakes just by sitting still, still and, and feeling what it feels like to be angry so that we can more, more quickly notice it when it arises in our interactions with other people. She says the key to, work, to, to working with this precept is how to be awake in the presence of anger instead of swinging into blind anger, or uh, into blind action, pardon me. Further, that working with the precept can, can enable us to spot the difference between action that arises 
out of self-centered anger, an action that arises out of life-centered anger, anger that is a genuine response to support life. This is, a, this is a, of course, a key point that's made by Zen teachers over and over again in, in various places that I've, I've been reading. There is an appropriate place for anger and that the dividing line comes up when uh, we see that we are acting out of a self-centered, um, uh, out of a way that, that reinforces our, our sense of separateness and self and self-protection, uh, as opposed to action or responses that have to do with opening up, reaching out, connecting with others in ways that support life. Uh, I'll have some more reflections along that line from some other sources that I'll share later on. But, <clears throat> but first, as, as I mentioned before, um, Rosemary Gates and Denise Alvarez, both psychotherapists, uh, have some, uh, some things that they want to share that uh, offer from a kind of a wider psychological perspective uh, that help that can help us in doing the step that that Rosetto suggests to skillfully examine where anger arises, what it feels like, how we use it, uh, what appropriate responses can be. So, um, Rosemary, would you go first? And uh, I think Rosemary has some materials that she wants to share on the screen. And let me make sure that I that you are unmuted. Yes. Okay, you're thank, right. You are. Thank you, thank you, Joel. So this, can everybody see this? Um, let, let me move this little thing up. Yeah, can everybody see this uh, flow chart um, pictorial? So um, I found this at a, a conference that I went to. Um, uh, it was like a, a book table, and this flow chart was there that I was really interested in. Um, so Joel sent us this email about the amygdala part of the brain. I thought, yeah, I'm glad that he did. And I've used this um, chart uh, with patients a lot. It's been really, really helpful for them to understand what happens when they do get triggered and what might they do to um, work through it. So basically, it's uh, this is a chart of the the three parts of the brain, so the frontal lobes, the thinking part with reasoning, problem solving, verbal expression. And I, I know a lot of you know this stuff, but we'll, this will just lead into the next part. And then the limbic system where the amygdala that Joel was telling us about uh, resides is the nonverbal, emotional and relational part, uh, the feeling and gut memories and, and traumatic memories, if there are any. And then the brainstem, which is the action, instinctive responses, heart rate, heart rate et cetera. You know what I mean? So um, we remember trauma, and this is not um, related only to traumatic experiences, but it, the brain kind of reacts the same way with an anger, angry impulse. So the brain, uh, it shows that um, when we remember, or maybe unconsciously don't remember, but are triggered by a traumatic event, the frontal lobes shut down. So um, yeah, so again, the frontal lobes, when um, we are triggered, they shut down. We're not thinking much. It's much harder to bring them back to a thinking uh, space, um, whereas Diane says to pause and look and listen. Um, what does happen is the this limbic system here um, it's responding with increased activity, especially in the amygdala, the brain's emotional memory, and an alarm goes off. And that alarm sets off the brainstem part, the reptilian brain, and we, um, the heart rate increases, stop breathing, um, this kind of a fight or flight um, situation happening. Okay, so what do we do? We try to um, step back and wake up that part of us. And, you know, if it is a historical part, some part of conditioning, it really helps. And it's not a pleasant thing to do, 
but to go back to what might have been the original experience that the current experience feels like, but is not. Because then we can say, ah, it's an unconscious memory, it's a flashback. I honor this. That's the way, the reason that I have this initial impulse to act out. I honor it, but I put it in kind of in the memory bank. And then I can, I have the time um, to see where to go with it. And in this case, what happens in the brain, if we can do that, so if we can interpret that initial impulse, that initial pain that we're feeling, um, it will turn the amygdala off. And it will give us a lot more options of what to do uh, with our anger and form a different relationship with it. So I just thought this is, might be helpful in terms of a pictorial. Um, and I'm so glad that Denise is um, going to uh, share with us some of the IFS um, strategies for what to do uh, and how internal family systems can help to um, uh, guide that process of if you if you have that awareness, where do you go with that? So thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. So just to, just to sum up, as, as Rosemary was just presenting, we can have a picture of what goes on in our brain that can provide a series of metaphors that will help us release anger. If we can say, oh yeah, that's what that's what's going on. I've had I have a memory of something that happened in the past. I'm triggered now. But I can think, oh yeah, my, part of my brain is doing what it does. And I can help myself by by letting that relax, you know. Can I say and, one more thing? An important thing I, I kind of left out was that um when the initial trigger happens, we really think we're in danger now, like we were then, let's say when we were a child or when that trauma happened, or that upsetting experience. That's the the um, the brain is reacting as if we're in that original danger. So if we can interpret that initial response um, as danger, then not danger now, that helps too. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I remember you saying, Rosemary, that those parts of the brain don't know what time it is. They have no conception that 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 something that happened in the past is not happening now. They are they're just awake to the threat now. So that's a, a very valuable point. And and again, uh, um, as as a as a strategy, as a metaphor, those can be helpful in just calming the whole system down. Um, and then Denise, I think, is going to talk from an IFS viewpoint. Okay. Uh, um, so it's really thrilling uh, to hear you talk, Rosemary, and open this uh, vision on our functioning regarding anger. And I would like to invite you. It's like a different approach. It's like uh, for me, IFS is really uh, connecting with our inner world and not it's it's really um, it's the inner world and it's very real. I would even say it's as real as the outer world. So um, now sitting in, um, with you and speaking, I feel like um, it's like opening a guest house and see who's there regarding around this anger theme. And in IFS, what really attracted me to this method was that uh, Dick Schwartz always says, all parts are invited, are welcome. And this is a huge challenge because right away, a lot of other parts could know that can't be possible. And ooh, did you hear that? And, and what, you know, many commentaries, but it's really taking it seriously. So ang parts who carry anger are welcome. And um, you already had a 
presentation about uh, IFS, so I will hold it a bit short and you can read it uh, afterwards in, I could show you some, uh, or give, send you some links. But in IFS, it's two parts who can carry um, <laughs> anger. One are the protectors, the managers, and one are the firefighters. So the protectors, their job is to make us successful in our lives, to control, to see that we keep uh, um, the balance and have a successful life. And in this group of managers, there can be parts who carry anger. Then there, is the, there are the firefighters and they come into action when, um, when something is triggered that reminds us of a very, very deep old wound. And it can be even a wound that comes throughout the line where we are, were born into. It can be our mothers or fathers or it can be really a big line. So when a firefighter, it can be a smell, it can be somebody who looks at you that triggers, oh, even unconsciously, then you might throw your dishes on the floor, you might uh, break a leg, you might be, uh, get an attack of anger and lose yourself. So that's also an anger. Now, the the one of the most important things in IFS and where we see that it helps to progress is the relationship between self and the parts. It's not parts and parts. They could talk for an eternity and nothing will change or little will change, but this self to part relationship. So how can we know that it is self? It's easy and tricky at the same time. Maybe you remember some of the qualities of self like compassion, curiosity. For instance, it could be a curiosity, but in behind of the curiosity would be, I want to get rid of this anger. It is not helpful in my life. So this is not self. And I think with a client or with myself, how can I detect, and each of you will do it in the, in the meditation a bit. With a client, I could see the, the color of the face changing, the breathing changing. Maybe the person makes longer breaks before he says or she says something. So there is a quality of, of a connection that is starting to be very tender. Um, that indicates that self is um, is on the forefront or Dick Schwartz says a certain percentage of self must be available. Um, yeah, I have to go and check my notes. Denise, while you're checking your notes, let me, if I may, I want to just ask again, so this is as, as Denise says, we each have these families, these communities within us uh, that have different roles or, or different parts have different roles and react in, in, in various ways. But I, what I want to point out that it's possible to think of the firefighters as kind of mapping on to the physical part of the brainstem, you know, affecting the way we breathe, affecting our muscle tension and so on. Uh, in, in, you know, in response to what is perceived as a threat and that the protectors and managers may, I'm just offering this provisionally, but they may have something to do with this limbic part of our brain, our mammalian brain that, that pays, has to pay attention to how we are relating to other people and whether or not we are being held in a in in a loving way by other people, or if there's some threat that we need to deal with. So those are those are just. I just want to point out that they these things have ways of mapping onto each other, at least metaphorically. Um. Yes. 
I think I have parts who have problems with um, such mappings because it puts me in the intellectual understanding parts of myself. And sometimes it is helpful for, for a therapy and sometimes it is not, but I have parts, I know them. <laughs> and they are dear to me, but I don't know them yet very well. And I think it's really rich, you know, each one takes the food from, from methods that speak to you. So, and then it's a slowly open up uh, process. So what I was looking um, up in my notes, um, you know, in Risetto, a lot of things that I read, I said, oh yes, that's, um, that goes very well with, with IFS. But then this idea of letting go of anger. So who is letting go of anger? And who is the part who wants to let go of anger? So in IFS, the, the letting go, it's a natural thing that comes through the connection from the angry part to the self that suddenly this part notices, oh, I have other ways to be a part of the system of this person. And as you said, Rosemary, you know, the, that's very much also in, in IFS that the parts who are um, hurt, the exiles, they are fixed in the time when the trauma happens. They have no clue that the person maybe is over 70 years old. So only already by um, informing them and saying, look, I did this and this and this, sometimes the part is shocked you know, oh, wow, and this calms the part down already a bit. Okay, I'm looking at the, the time. Um, so just one more thing of anger. I think it's, um, we have parts who are, are judgmental against anger, who belittle anger, you know, with children when they are angry, oh, such a child, why are you so angry? Or um, then we have proud parts of, um, of the angry parts who can see, uh, who can say, um, good, you are standing up for yourself. Uh, we have parts who are afraid of overwhelm. And it's all these questions of getting to know these angry parts that help them letting go or changing or not having any need of the anger anymore and giving having the trust in us that we can go and see where this anger comes from and what it wants to protect namely the exile okay i think that's it for the moment thank you and Denise, uh, you will be offering a, a, a guided meditation or a guide or prompt to meditation before we, before we go to the breakout rooms later on, right? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for, for that presentation. I'm very curious about, about those parts that resist uh, or, 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 or uh, have questions about the, the, the type of mapping that I was suggesting. I, I'd love to talk to you more about that. Because I, I, I for one find it freeing to have these metaphors available to. So it's not just like this part of myself has to carry it all by itself, you know. Um, but okay, so let me let me add a few more comments here um, from some other <coughs> some other sources. So Robert Aiken Roshi has a wonder, there's a wonderful book called A Mind of Clover, uh, Ref Reflections on the Precepts. Uh, at one point he quotes Bodhidharma, uh, who is said to have said, self nature is subtle and mysterious. In the realm of the selfless Dharma, not contriving reality for the self is called the precept 
of not indulging in anger. Not contriving reality for the self. That's a, a, a dense phrase, but I hear it as being very close to our uh, chant that we say uh, that was composed by a poet uh, for, for Joko Beck, caught in the self-centered dream, only suffering, holding the self-centered thoughts exactly the dream. Each moment, life as it is, the only teacher, being just this moment, compassion's way. That if we are contriving reality to fit our preconceptions, uh, to be the way that we want it to be, if we are, are choosing what we want, and trying to avoid what we don't want, that that will lead to suffering. And that that is, that is part of the path of, of anger and uh, not contriving reality for the self is called the precept of not indulging in anger. I always have trouble with this, this uh, phrase, is called the precept of not indulging in anger. I, I have come to interpret it as being not contriving reality for the self is what we mean by the precept of not indulging in anger, something like that. Um, Denise and Rosemary have pointed out how our animal bodies and our mammalian bodies and minds work. Uh, and the, the staggeringly complex ways in which parts can interact with each other. Um, and I, I have tried to emphasize this a lot in my talks with the precepts class, that in some ways, by taking up the precepts, we are swimming against the stream of part of what makes us human, our, our, um, our bodies, our minds are just set up in certain ways that we have to learn as we grow and as we mature uh, through the precepts, through the Buddhist teachings uh, that we have to learn to essentially swim against. Um, so uh, I really appreciate these psychological approach approaches, and I really appreciate uh, Joko Beck's teaching as welcoming these psychological approaches uh, as tools that we can use on the path. Uh, but how do, is, is it possible to go, um, I won't say beyond psychological understanding, but to have more than psychological understanding of our lives uh, to, in essence, what is it that makes this, part, this precept and these tools for dealing with this precept, what makes them part of Zen practice? So I, I want some, some more quotes from Robert Aiken that I think uh, points to the answer to that. He says at one point in the chapter in his book, The Mind of Clover about anger, says, I recall at age 33, sitting in my first sashin in a Japanese monastery, devoting my full attention to cursing my mother over a misunderstanding about money in which I thought she believed that I had not behaved honorably. The incident was a full two years past at that time. Sitting there on my cushions at Enkakuji in 1950, murmuring to myself, my damned mother, as a pernicious anti-mantra, was an exercise in self-identity, in reifying the self. That was the best I could do at that time. I knew very well that I was not seeing beyond a self-centered place. And I tried to return to my koan, the koan that his teacher had given him, whenever I caught myself indulging in my fixation. But the emotion was as powerful as a forest fire, and I could not cope with it at all. Forest fire and firefighters acting in the same overpowering way, I think. Those metaphors match up there. My problem, he continues, was simply that I was immature. The three poisons are identified as poisons because they are indeed poisonous, the most deadly forms of childishness. When we were children and adolescents, we hated in self-defense, and we maintained ourselves and our groups with violent words and even violent actions. 
we were in the process of creating our identities. So he starts by saying childlessness is something like poisonousness, but he, but I, I, I believe that he is moving away from that there, saying we were in the process of creating our identities. And those identities, I would say, in line with what Denise was just saying, are, are multiplicitous and often doing their best, even when they're in conflict, to help us live our daily lives. He continues, now we are adult. Perhaps we still, but perhaps we still feel that adolescent protectiveness. And when someone appears with harsh words of criticism, it is only with difficulty, if at all, that we can acknowledge that they represent the appearance of the avatar of the Buddha. He quotes a Chinese master whose name I will not attempt to pronounce. If treacherous talk <laughs> is constantly in your ears and unwanted thoughts are constantly in your mind, you can turn these about and use them as whetstones to enhance your practice. If every word that comes to your ears were agreeable and all things in your mind were pleasant, then your whole life would be poisoned and wasted. We are not seeking merely to quiet our minds, Roshi, uh, Aiken Roshi says, but to practice. This means using what comes up in outward circumstances or in our heads. Whatever happens can serve as a reminder. A friend of mine quotes the Zen teacher, Sung San, the one who praises you is a thief. The one who criticizes you is your true friend. Everything is a whetstone. And he offers another image, the, uh, the image of the protector spirit known in Eastern Buddhism as, or Japanese Buddhism, as Fudo Myo'o, the unmovable king of subtle wisdom in the Buddhist pantheon, sitting in the midst of flames, red in the face, eyes bulging, and with the fiercest expression imaginable. And he says that, where'd it go? I've lost my quote. I overwrote it with something else. But that feud, Fudo Myo'o is the mirror image of Kanzeon, uh, Avalokiteshvara, meeting the world with uh, discerning fierceness as a mirror of all-embracing compassion. And he quotes Thich Nhat Hanh. Aiken Roshi quotes Thich Nhat Hanh. Treat your anger with the utmost respect and tenderness, for it is no other than yourself. Do not suppress it. Simply be aware of it. Awareness is like the sun. When it shines on things, they are transformed. When you are aware that you are, anger, that you are angry, your anger is transformed. If you destroy anger, you destroy the Buddha. For Buddha and Mara are of the same essence. Mindfully dealing with anger is like taking the hand of a little brother. So just different reflections on why it is actually good and necessary to acknowledge our anger, how anger, when it's not devoted to reifying our sense of separate self, is uh, an energy that uh, can help us be strong and passionate in, for good in the world. Um, and that I, I see Ahsoka shaking his head like, no, that's, that never works that way. I'd like to hear uh, uh, from you, Ahsoka, but uh, in a minute. Um, so, um, these are the teachings that we have available to us, that there are parts that we want to push away because they may be threatening uh, with their anger and their anger may seem overwhelming. And certainly in my, I certainly know that, that my anger when I most notice it is when it is a raging fire that, that uh, just induces me to lash out and that in, in ways that I almost immediately regret. And that has happened way too many times in my life. Uh, and I'm, I'm, as I say, I'm just grateful that there are possibilities within our practice and within the language that has been brought to us from teachers in uh, psychology that can help us to integrate all these parts so that we don't have to lash out, so that we can 
more we can use the energy that underlies anger as part of our skillful means of connecting with the world. So uh, Denise said that she has a prompt that she would like to offer us for taking into the uh, breakout rooms that, that I would suggest that we have now. So if you have some paper and pencil handy, it might be good to, to grab them. Uh, and Denise, I, I asked Denise if she would go through them twice, the first time and then the second time slower for people to make notes. And so Denise, would you talk about this? So this is a big challenge for me to do the same thing twice. Um, I don't know if it could be a pop, an option that one of you will take the notes while I'm speaking and then for the rest of us. I will do, I will do my best to do that. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Because otherwise one goes in and out and in and out and okay. So before I start, I just wanted to um, point out something that came up to me while you were talking, Joel. Sometimes we, we use the same word and mean different things. Uh, for instance, the notion of self, you know, self-centered and self-led and what's about this self? And oh, this person has a lot of self, this person has not a lot of self. I don't, um, I don't uh, go for this idea. And in IFS self is really something in us that recognizes something that is bigger than us and which is not very um, personal. So the curiosity is not personal, but it's pure curiosity or the compassion is not my personal compassion because I'm such a good per person, but it's something big to us and we can, and each part has a bit of self in it. So it's very fractal, the, the IFS model. So just, I wanted to say this before we start. So I invite you to just sit uh, comfortably, which means find a position that you feel held within yourself. Your bones are a very good core to hold us upright. It just takes a moment to really, maybe you can also make small movements until you feel, okay, now it feels like sitting with the least effort possible for now. You can observe the movement within you, creating by the air that comes into you and goes out of you constantly. And this very interesting moment when it goes from the in-breath to the out-breath. Sometimes we take a little break. Sometimes it flows from one into the other. Okay. And then in your rhythm, in your own way, turn your attention inside. And you can like put the question into your inner world that we have been talking and studying about anger and parts who hold anger. And just check whether there is anything showing up 
um, it can be a sensation in your body. It can be a thought. It can be a part saying anger, me, no, no. Just check who is showing up around anger. Sometimes it's a change of temperature perceived in your body. Or a small contraction. In your jaw. Behind your eyes. And whenever you notice something that you would like to visit and get to know a little bit better, so turn your attention towards the place, the image, the voice, the body sensation you choose, and just let it know that you are conscious about it, that you know that it is there. And you can check is there any response or change in the part you uh, get to meet? And now have a look. Are there any parts showing up regarding this place that you just started to meet? Are there any opinions, voices, other body sensations? Just, just wander around. Maybe there is a part that is louder than others and wants to be seen by you. And I just want to ask, uh, to say that maybe for some of you, it's really a new way to look at the inner world. So take it easy. If you don't hear, see, feel anything, that's completely fine. Give yourself time. And check whether the parts who showed up who have an opinion towards the part who carries anger, if they are okay, if you just go and have a first, maybe it's not the first, but just have a meeting with this angry part. And if it is so, then turn towards the part who carries anger and ask it if there is anything that it wants you to know about it.
And if it is sharing something with you, check what does this do with you? What do you feel towards this part when it shares something? Is there another part reacting or can you relate to it from your heart? And then check if there is anything you would like to know from the part. And even maybe ask it if it wants to be called angry part, maybe it wants to be called differently. And then maybe let the part know that we are here all together in this learning process together. And it's just a first step to get you to know each other. So if slowly we will round up this meeting, it's not because you're not interested, it's because we are in this learning process with the time that is given for this process now. And you can go and meet another time. And before we uh, close it, just take a note Take notice of how you're sitting, how you're breathing, and any other sensation that might be different that, than from when you started. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. Denise, thank you for that. It's kind of hard to imagine going into breakout rooms and, and reading the uh, prompts that Rosemary so skillfully has copied into the chat and not being guided by your beautiful voice, Denise, and your, your demeanor. So I, I, I apologize. I misunderstood what you, what you had said uh, originally. I thought it was going to be briefer. Uh, and, and, you know, and, 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 but I love how you, how you guided us step by step and, and so gently and, and carefully through all those steps. So, um, I, I did save the chat so I can, I can send this series of uh, directions to everybody. Thank you so much. I would like it if we could have some small group interaction and, and just, if you would, just um, spend some time sitting and recollecting this uh, beautiful guided meditation that De Denise just offered us, and then share your thoughts on what came up for you uh, with the others in your breakout rooms, okay? So uh, in my... Uh, in my breakout room, I was in a breakout room with Becky and Susan, Susan Kaderka, and uh, Susan brought up a very important point that I, I think uh, that I asked if she would be willing to share with the group. So uh, we have about uh, 10 more minutes for uh, reflecting on what was shared in the small breakout rooms for anybody that wants to, to add what they can or, or what they would like to. And um, 
I'm watching Denise. She looks like she's got the same uh, upper respiratory thing that I have. I'm so sorry. I'm I, I'm getting a little better. But Susan, would you share what you shared in our in our breakout room? Uh yes. Um, so um, I was telling Joel and Becky that uh, with all of the precepts, I've sort of used it as Diane Rosetto invites us to sort of uh, reflect on our relationship to whatever it is. Uh, and as I was uh, reflecting on uh, anger, uh, I was really aware that my primary relationship with anger is that I have great difficulty accessing anger at all. Uh, and so it's not about controlling it or channeling it or engaging constructively with it or understanding that it's like getting to it kind of, you know, and I, I hesitated to start, I didn't know whether that's a whole other conversation or that's sort of the flip side of this or, or what, but it did feel because just in my own upbringing and conditioning, it was just not allowed. And, uh, and it was not allowed in a, in a way that felt sort of life-threatening to me as a, as a child and as a growing person. So, um, so, so uh, Denise, the reflection that you led us through that exercise was really wonderful. But for me, what it put me uh, in connection with was the fear of, of anger. And uh, so that's just a, sometimes, you know, <laughs> Sometimes I feel like, oh, everybody else has got that, and I, I don't even have that, you know. So it's it, that's just another piece of it is sort of is that, you know, a, a deep exile, you know, some something I can't, I can't access. So I, I have trouble with that. So I just thought I would share that in case anyone else is in that place. Can I just react quickly to Susan? Um, you know, it's whoever comes all the parts that show up they are welcome so it's really and the parts that show up they are a trailhead to our inner world so you got the trailhead yes thank you mm -hmm. denise so that's a i i think you were pointing to this before but let me ask you to elaborate on this notion of the trailhead suppose that you are you are inviting a part to come forward and that part is not coming forward, but what you what you hear from is another part that's saying you're not allowed to go there. It's too dangerous. Uh, I, I'm, you know, let's think about that movie we saw last week or something like that. Uh, some distraction or some other uh, strategy. And uh, I, you pointed to, you know, a kind of a dialogue. Like, uh, are there other parts that emerge? Uh, while you are inviting a certain part to come forward, uh, but would you would you talk some about meeting a protector or a manager uh, who who um, has uh, is carrying strong feelings about contacting another part that that is a kind of an exile that you cannot get to? Yes, definitely, Joel. It's <laughs> it's um, it's a protector, you know, who has its reasons why it shows up so strongly and it's so the focus would be on the part that showed up and really befriending it and getting to know and uh where does this fear come from and and really to to get to know it and how long have you been here and just giving its pace so and and also i think often parts when they suddenly feel, oh, there is a change possible, help. And then they show up and really telling them, look, we just go as slow or as fast as it is good for the client. And if you feel that we go too far fast, just let us know. It's really um, taking them seriously. And it, it sounds to me like Susan has, in, in this case, Susan, if you don't mind, I'm going to reflect on what you said, that Susan has done just that. She realizes there's a part that wants to protect her, that wants to keep her safe, 
and um, and and she is honoring that part for that, and she realizes as an adult self that that came from a time in her life when it was absolutely necessary to not let certain emotions show, not to not be reactive in a way, uh, and that the, the, it sounds like Susan is honoring that part. Yeah. Uh, is there is there more beyond that type of honoring that you think? Um, I think <laughs> honoring is the first step, and then it's getting to know it has a story. So getting to know its story and what it is afraid would happen if she would show or contact this anger, you know, also meeting the, the concern of the part and bringing it up to date. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a whole, um, you know, it's a step by step and the part will show you how when it is ready to uh, give space or step aside but take your time well, thank, thank you Denise mm -hmm. this is uh, time it's running short I'm sorry so uh, I, I, I saw that Claudine had her hand up but then she lowered it uh, Claudine, can I just ask you if you would oh. speak and then Mary Beth? Yes, it's about uh, having two parts or maybe other feelings behind the feeling of anger. And I realized <laughs> in the knees exercise that behind my anger that I lived with all my life, was also a, a feeling of freedom and proudness. I was, the little girl in me was so proud to be able to be angry with my mother, even if it was so dangerous, but I couldn't express it freely. So because I couldn't express it freely, as Susan said before, this, this part very proud behind began to be smart and find little cunning way of, of enjoying life and a lot of joy, creativity and, and freedom were hidden behind my anger. And I'm just taking the step of welcoming this, my joy and, and all this back that was so mixed up with anger. And now I begin to be able to, how do you say that, to take it back in my whole personality, in my own person. And it, this exercise, Denise, was really precious to me. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Beth, would you go ahead? Yeah. So I just wanted to give a real life example of a part that I've been working with for a very long time. <clears throat> just to think if I tell this story, it, it might help somebody else. And I've been working with a, a skillful therapist on this part. So whenever my angry parts, when we try to work with angry parts, I have a sleepy part that shows up. And this sleepy and tired part would show up just about the time that I felt like I was really getting to know the angry part. And it's taken a year, at least a year. And, and sometimes my therapist would say, well, what does the sleepy part need? And I would go and lay down for 30 minutes. You know, he would stay on the virtual camera. I would lay down because that was what the sleepy part needed. So I just wanted to give you you know that example of I'm still working with that part sometimes the part opens up and 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 I get through to the anger but still more times than not I'm working with the angry part to accept it and, and what do you need so I offer that too thank you well we have our we have our uh, google group where I, I, I want to say again, um, I uh, am very grateful for the 
uh, reflections that other people have shared on all the precepts that we have gone through so far and, and, and on this. Masoko, thank you for that heart-rending poem you shared this week about anger and, and other emotions. And I just want to invite everyone to continue this conversation uh, via our, our, our group um, list, sir, that we, that we share. Uh, it's so important. I, I feel so lucky that we have uh, everyone in this group. And, and just to encourage, if you have not spoken at all or in a while, please share what you can that would be a benefit to this group. It would be a it would be a great gift and a great blessing to this group for you to to share in the way that that uh, has been shared today. And and again, thank you so much to Rosemary and Denise for uh, these uh, ways of thinking that lead to greater integration, that lead to greater awareness and wholeness and. Uh, I will say, it, it, Denise was talking about self in, in the way that it's, it's used in IFS uh, and, um, and and questioning the way that self was used, you know, by Joko Beck and by others in, in Zen teaching. And that the, that, that self is, is more, um, it's a word that means something like um, fixation in, in conditioning egoistic separation uh, and so on. So, you know, this, this is a, a problem that comes up over and over again when um, um, IFS bumps up against Zen terminology. So <clears throat> uh, I, I hope that's more clear there. Um, and uh, our time is officially up. Uh, again, I say thank you and my, my deep house. Uh, Ahsoka, let's you and me email back and forth about what's going on. Or, or if you want to do it on the on the group form, that would be more than welcome as well. Next meeting will be, you know, I don't have the date in front of me, but it will be in approximately one month. Um, and um, thank you. Um, the next the next chapter has to do with the I believe the three treasures. I'll, I'll send out some information about it, but it has to do with integrating our practice with our Sangha, with the teachings, and with the Buddha, the, 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 the life force throughout the universe, or the teacher who existed as a historical figure, and everything all at once. You know? So have a great day. Thank you.